Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On June 30th, 1908, the largest asteroid event in recorded history flattened an estimated 80 million trees in approximately an 830 square mile area. It took two decades before scientists found this region and realized the true devastation. This is because it was in a remote area of Siberia. Some thought aliens. I mean, maybe they were right because a future head coach of the NFL was, air quotes, born about two months later that would ultimately bring futuristic concepts to the league that maybe could only be explained by alien intervention. This coach's name, Paul Brown. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time we stop with the DeLorean. The date is September 7th, 1908, and we are in Norwalk, Ohio. And depending on what story you believe, this was the actual birth of legendary coach Paul Brown. Of course, maybe it would make more sense if the intro were true, because he fell from the sky in a pod similar to Clark Kent. Because, let's face it, this guy was a super coach, pioneering modern football coaching probably more than any other person in history. He's also listed as the number one coach on the list in Matt DiBiase's book, Lords of the Gridiron 2, Pro Football's Greatest Coaches. Now, there can be debates and arguments for every single list and all sorts of different types of things in sports. But we're going to get specifically into the coaching debate. The pro football coaching debate, that is, here with Matt DiBias in a little bit. And he's even going to go ahead and break down the ranking system that he used to help us understand his madness. But before we get into the interview, i got to let you know, the football history dude is a proud member of something called the Sports History Network, soon to be the headquarters of sports yesteryear. And if you're not familiar with the Sports History Network, We are a podcast network in the sports history niche, but we also have many articles and we're starting to work into YouTube, TikTok space, all other sorts of things with some original short videos. So if you are into sports history or even anything close to it, then I highly recommend you check us out. And the best way to do so is over on the website, sportshistorynetwork.com. After you do that, let's kick this baby up to 88 miles an hour and let's listen to the interview with Matt DiBiase. Let's, let's just go with that. Let's, before we get started, so the title of the book we're going to talk about is Lords of the Gridiron 2, but before we do that, is there a Lords of the Gridiron 1? Well, it was simply called Lords of the Gridiron, uh, College Football's Greatest Coaches, and well, for the pro one, I just put number two and all of that, so that's basically what it is, you know? So yeah, again, the precursor is like you get the Lords of the Gridiron, you talk about the college coaches, and now we're going to get into the pro football coaches. Um, let's... Let's take me back to the origin story, though, of Lords of the Gridiron 2. I mean, what is it all about, and what was this? where did this concept come from to begin with? Well, it was the logical successor to my, my third book, Lords of the Gridiron, College Football's Greatest Coaches. I knew when I wrote that third book that I was going to, after I finished that one up, I was going to immediately go into the pro. So, and I, I started that college football book in uh, 2017, and I was doing interviews, and 
when if I was talking to a, a, a college football player who also played in the NFL and also played for like a, a great coach in the NFL, I would actually do a dual interview. First, tell me about your college football coach and then tell me about your pro coach. Like in my present book, Lords of the Great Iron 2, I, I mean, I talked to Leroy Jordan, who not only regaled me with memories of Bear Bryant, but also about Tom Landry, um, uh, uh, Jim McMahon. He not only regaled me with his memories of Lavelle Edwards at BYU, he also gave me beautiful chapter and verse about Mike Ditka, uh, uh, just as prime examples. Um, Joe Washington, not only did he talk about his years at the Oklahoma Sooners under Barry Switzer, he gave me uh, fantastic material on Joe Gibbs. Uh, and so on and so forth. So I was getting, I was actually giving double mileage out of that. And it was, and I was getting great stuff and all of that. And so as soon as my college football book uh, came out in 2019, I immediately delved into, you know, Lords of the Gridiron 2. And it was just nonstop. I was just uh, writing out the chapters, uh, doing the calculations, uh, still tinkering with the rating system. It wasn't until like uh, about a year or so ago that I finally perfected the method. But once I had it, I knew pretty much who it was going to be. It just, it's just, it was just the fine tuning. Where was the final running order going to be? And the end result is what you see now, which is up at Amazon.com. You will not see my book. It's not available in stores. You must purchase it online at Amazon. Either type in my name, Matthew Dibiaz, M A T T H E W uh, D I B I A S E. Or just simply the title, Lords of the Gridiron 2, College, a Pro Football's Greatest Coaches. And there it is. And it was just, you know, I was just continuously, you know, writing, revising, you know, updating. Because, you know, it was over a three-year period with each uh, NFL season completed. I had to re-update the or running because I have active coaches on in the book here. So I had to, you know, readjust, you know, to reflect you know, the results and all that. In fact, uh, it wasn't until after the last Super Bowl, you know, that was played that I finally had the final running order. And then I just had to tweak, you know, just do the tweaking and then enormous editing. I mean, from uh, mid-February to literally the last day in August, I was just constantly editing and editing, proofing, you know, uh, 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 correcting in this. Uh, it was just nonstop, but it was beautiful, though. I mean, it was just amazing to see how it all came out. And I, I, it's a book. It's not. Yeah, it's not. Just, it's a little bit of a biography, but it, you know. But also, I get into tactics. I, I when I talk to players, I would get into what were, what were your, what was Mike Ditka's offensive strategies. What were his defensive strategies? I remember like Doug Plank, uh, who was a sports commentator in Chicago. He gave me fantastic insights into the forty six defense that helped the Bears win the you know Super Bowl twenty. I mean, he gave me great nuts and bolts. Gary Larson. Who played for the Purple People Eaters, you know, under Bud Grant, Minnesota, gave me great uh, insights about how the Minnesota Vikings defense during those glory years from '69 to '76, you know, played defense. You know, what, what, what were their formations? That you know, how often did they like the blitz? Who you know, who were the sack masters? What were your coverages? So my book gets into gets into meat and potatoes. I mean, you get into how often would you blitz? What type of if you, did you like to use trick plays? I mean, like Tom Landry. I mean, Dan Reeves. Told me that Tom Landry loved trick plays. I mean, here he is, this conservative image, but love, he loved trickery. He loved trick plays and was not afraid to use them. I mean, in the Ice Bowl, he used uh, Dan Reeves himself through that halfback option that temporarily gave Dallas the lead uh, in Super Bowl X. He had Hollywood Henderson, you know, do that uh, reverse on the opening kickoff of the game that almost almost scored a touchdown on that. Uh, uh, Super Bowl twelve. he had Bob Newhouse throw that halfback option to Golden Richards. So, no, Tom Landry was not afraid to use trickery at all. Not afraid, you know, which is kind of interesting. I mean, for all of his stern, conservative image, no. He loved. He liked sleight of hand, yeah, very much, yeah. And um, we got into – I would ask when I interviewed players, I would take, what was his personality like? I mean, you know, uh, was he – you know, was he – was he intense? I mean, was he one for giving the big speech? Was he a good orator and all that? Was he approachable? Could you talk to him about things other than football, uh, things of that nature? I mean, Landry, not much, but Madden, yeah, you could. I mean, Pat, Pat, Pete Banaszak told me, yeah, you could, you, you could talk to him as a human being, not just as a coach, but you know, he could talk to you about things other than football. John Madden, a very human figure. I mean, Pete Banaszak gave me great insights about what it was that made John Madden the way he was. I mean. 
I think only John Madden could have co coached the Oakland Raiders in that incarnation. I mean, given the rebelliousness of it and given the fact he had Al Davis, you know, watching his every moon. I mean, that's what Pete uh, Banaszak called him, the Messiah. Uh, you know, and, and you, yeah, but the fact is that Madden worked perfectly hand in glove with Davis. I mean, uh, actually, Madden was the great, perfect counterweight to Al Davis. I mean, Davis was so intense. I mean, cutthroat, the ultimate cutthroat. And Madden lightened the load, as it were. He was, he was more, you know, he was more, as he, he could, he could laugh. He was more human in a sense. You know, he could, he could lighten. Al Davis is you know, a dark intensity with, you know, with his Irish humor and all that and his expansive, you know, uh, uh, brio and all of that. And and the fact that he simplified things, he didn't have a lot of rules, just hustle, be on time. And just when you step on that field, play, play your head, you know, play, play your heart out. And that's why all those guys who were cast offs, they responded under John Madden. And it took a while, but finally they won Super Bowl eleven, and they were able to break that playoff curse. You know, we're going to not have him on this list, of course, but like, so from someone that looks at coaches and everything, how much does Dan Campbell remind you of someone like a uh, John Madden? Dan Campbell? I, the uh, new Detroit Lions head coach. Do you know much? I mean, you you real. this isn't history by any means. This is just happening this year, but. Well, no, I haven't even evaluated him. I mean, to be eligible, you have to, uh, for my system, you have to have five years uh, uh, at least a minimum of five seasons on your belt. It's too soon to evaluate Dan Campbell in that sense, but he's got his work cut out for him. I mean, Detroit has just been so down in the mouth for so long. It's it's actually it's a sad tale and all that. I mean, I mean, uh, seventy years ago they had an, a great history. I mean, they were a powerhouse in the NFL. I mean, but then after you know after buddy parker's departure it's just been a slow descent into utter despair and uh, mostly mediocrity and sometimes just utter futility in that sense so i i can't really re evaluate dan campbell at the present time no no i need a few more years yeah oh for sure yeah he's definitely a guy i mean he's only in, been a coach for a couple of years now but i guess i was more getting out of this the, the fact of like how Madden could relate to the players and that's kind of how I feel like Dan Campbell can too. Yeah. So we'll we'll see the stories out the tape is maybe uh Lords of the Lords of the uh, why do I want to keep going Lords of the Rings or Lords of the Fly? But <laughs> Lords of the Great yeah. Iron uh, part 14. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go number 14 down the road and you'll get Dan Campbell in there. But we, so speaking of that like why coaches because not just this book or the other book but some other books. Why coaches for you? I have this philosophy that I have adhered to throughout my writing career is that history abhors a vacuum. And if you look at my first three books, especially my first three books, uh, no one had ever written books on that type before. Like my first book, Bench Bosses, the NHL's Coaching Elite, no one had ever evaluated uh, the greatest NHL head coaches using an analytical method. It had never been done. Yeah, there have been bios on NHL hockey coaches, but no one had ever decided – who was greater, Toe Blake or Scotty Bowman? Who was better, uh, Pat Burn, you know, Pat Burns or T or Terry Murray? No one had done that before. So my first book, you know, filled a void. Then my second book, The Art of the Dealers, the NHL's Greatest General Managers, was absolutely groundbreaking. I mean, no one, forget about hockey, just the four major North American sports, or I don't even know about any sport, had ever attempted to rate the fifty best general managers in a given sport. I mean. Totally groundbreaking. I mean, imagine if someone had did that for Major League Baseball. Someone wrote a book. Okay, who was really greater, uh, the late Branch Rickey or John Schurholtz, You know, who built the Atlanta Braves and the Kansas City Royals. I mean, I mean, I, I, wouldn't that be intriguing? I mean, who knows? Maybe if I live long enough, maybe I'll do it in next decade. Yeah, you know, and all of that. Maybe if I live long enough. You know, or hit hit uh, any baseball historian out there. You know, hey. It's out there if you want to try it. I mean, it's groundbreaking, and and that's what my second book was groundbreaking. And then my you know my third book, uh, Lords of the Great Iron College Football's Greatest Coaches. Again, no one had ever attempted to rate the greatest head coaches at the Division One A level. We're not talking about Division Two or Division Three or anything like that. Strictly Division One A. You know, no one had ever said who was really greater, Bear Bryant or Nick Saban. Woody Hayes or Bo Schembechler. Uh, you know, no one had ever done that using a, a, a metrical system. I did it, though. I created that system. 
And, and the end result is what you see. It's available up on Amazon. And all four of my books are up on Amazon. Just type in my name and you'll see, you'll see my page and all of that. And my books are right there. Um, so I, I'm a professional historian by trade. And my day job is I work for the, I have worked for the National Archives and Records Administration, uh, at Philadelphia uh, for 31 and a half, for 31 years. So I'm a professional historian by trade. But I have always loved sports history, even in childhood. I mean, when I was 10 years old, I could recite all the World Series winners from 03 to 1973 uh, and all that. I mean, I couldn't play sports worth a dog gone. But I, 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 I knew the history. I could recite the stats. I could recite who won this, who won the NFL. Test. I could always do that. I could always do the trivia bit in my head and all that. And 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 I started writing when I was 17 years old. Uh, in the beginning, it was just mostly poetry, song lyrics. Uh, in the 1980s, when I was in college, I became an op-ed columnist for my college newspaper. And I did that for like um, three whole years. And then after I graduated from college, I got into my job. For once in a while, I might submit like an op-ed piece for a local newspaper in South Jersey. Nothing, no major newspaper, anything like that. So I was all, and I was all, I was still writing, you know, songs, you know, poetry and all that. And then in the mid in the mid two thousands, I started working on an abortive uh, oral history of the NHL's original six era when there were only six teams from forty two to uh, sixty seven. But that never came off the ground. But in the early 2010s, I started writing articles about – I started developing the concept, which later became Bench Bosses. And I started writing a series of columns, and a fellow columnist at InsideHockey.com said, Matt, why don't you make a book out of this? So the light bulb went off, and I started – doing that. And I began working on my first book and I finished it in 2013, but it took two years before uh, the publishing firm, uh, Penguin Random House Canada, finally put the book out. There were some delays and all of that. And I began, I began my writing career and all of that. I, my first book came out in 2015. My second book came out in 2017. My first book was conventionally published with Penguin Random House, but my last three books were self-published using first it was CreateSpace, but now it's Kindle digital public, uh, digital publishing via Amazon and all of that. Uh, and so that I've been using going the self-publishing field and all that. But yeah, and but like getting back to Lords of Great Iron Two, it was just I was just building it up piece by piece, uh, you know, pl uh, coach by coach, and and the end result is what you see there. But I'm filling a void in history. Someone else had try attempted to rate uh, the greatest NFL head coaches. Uh, a Facebook friend of mine, Sean Lehman, who uh, lives in uh, upstate New York. In his book, The Pro Football Historical Abstract, which came out in 2007, he had a section devoted where he rated and ranked the 50 greatest NFL coaches. But with all due respect to Sean, and I love his book, he actually, his book inspired me to go to, to attempt my, my all my books and all of that. He and Bill James inspired, were the inspirations for my what I've been doing now. I found certain flaws in his rating system. Like there were some things he neglected like he didn't uh, award points for finishing in first place and all that. And also, this was this is where I found a little fault with Bill James and, and Sean Lehman. My discovery was if you can quantify coaching success, you can also quantify coaching failure. And what I did was I created a plus minus system where not only do you reward plus points for succeeding, you also take away points for failure. In other words, if you finish in last place, I'm going to take away uh, six points. If you fail to make the playoffs, I'm going to take away one point. Uh, if, you're if your percentage is like above 475, but it's below 500, then I'm going to take away two points. But if your winning percentage is like 063, I'm going to take away like 10, or 10 points. I mean, it's a sliding scale, okay? And that was another flaw with uh, Sean Lehman and Bill James's thing. They would just award a single point if you met a certain standard. In other words, each point, in other words, having a winning season and winning the World Series were both equal in value. And I thought, no, it should be sliding in scale, you know? And and I, that was another of my breakthroughs there. That's the difference between my system and like what Bill James did when he was rating baseball managers in the mid nineties and what Sean Lehman was doing with his book in 07. That was my breakthrough. And that's where my system deviates from their methods and all that. 
and it's symmetrical. Everything is perfectly counterbalanced there, and I and and I I believe it's I believe it stands up in my view. I think it's fair. I think it, I, when I saw the final thoughts, yes, yes, it, it's logical. It works. It it actually makes sense. So how would you maybe go through and maybe more bridged version of like what were some of the factors of creating like a score? So I'm I'm on the book right. I'm on page. Oh, I'm like way at the end. So it's got like all the coaches listed. And then at the end, it gives them like that, that percentage that gives them the ultimate victory. Like, so maybe we can even just go like, what are the different initials mean? What's like CV, ASR, BQ, B5 and that type of thing. Okay. I created uh, six uh, standards uh, of, of rating. CV means a career value. It measures basically the quantity of your success during a coach's career. Average season rating, which I invented with my first book, Bench Bosses, the NHL's Coaching Elite, that's, that measures the quality of your success. If your ASR is very high, that means it's what it symbolizes is that the coach in question is able to have his team maintain a high level of excellence with no real peaks and valleys. Like, according to my calculations, Vince Lombardi was the greatest NFL coach of the postseason era from 1933 to the present time in, ter- in terms of his average season rating, which meant in terms of maintaining constant high excellence, he was the greatest NFL coach of all time in that regard there, uh, which is not surprising given his fantastic record of excellence and all of that. Now, BQ, that stands, it's a Latin term meaning quinquennia means your best, fi- it's a five-year, quinquennia means Latin for five years a five-year period. And what that does is measure a coach's five consecutive years. Like, for instance, uh, Paul Brown from like 1946 to 1950, uh, Chuck Knoll from like, you know, 1974 to 1979 and all that. The most strongest five consecutive year period, which which measures your ability to maintain what was your absolute peak period of time. Now, the B5 value measures your best five years. It doesn't have to be consecutive, though, in rare instances. It can be consecutive. Basically, what I took is a coach's best five individual seasons and put them all together. And as, you know, your best, basically, your best five performances as a coach. Uh, PV means playoff value. What that does, it measures a coach's ability. How, did, how do his teams perform in playoff, strictly playoff competition? You know, you get points for appearing in a playoff. You get points for like finishing first in your division, which means you get a higher seed. So that's the difference between a wild card berth and a higher seed and all that. You get points for getting into the Super Bowl and then, of course, winning the Super Bowl. And then conversely, on the negative side, you, I take away points if you failed to make the playoffs or if you lost the Super Bowl. Uh, that, uh, 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 that's an aspect of that. But those coaches who really did great in playoff competition, that's another standard. And then the sixth standard is RSV, which is regular season value, which evaluates a coach's how did his teams uh, perform in strictly regular season fashion. You know, not not counting the playoffs, you know, nothing involved with that. Uh, but just how do they perform in regular season uh, a competition? Like, for instance, Marty Schottenheimer, that was of his six categories. That was his best category of all. According to my calculations, he was the ninth greatest NFL coach in, in terms of his regular season performance there. Whereas conversely, his playoff performance, his PV value, not not very good because he never, ever made it to the Super Bowl. In fact, he is Marty Schottenheimer, God rest his soul, was the greatest heartbreak coach of all time. I, I invented that term in my first book. That's a coach who can uh, he can lead his team to the playoffs, but he can't get them into the championship finals. And to be a heartbreak coach, you have to have a minimum of five playoff appearances without ever reaching the championship finals in whatever sport you're doing, whether it's baseball, football, basketball, or, or hockey and all of that. And Marty Schottenheimer was the uh, was the greatest heartbreak coach of all time. 12 appearances, and he never earned a ticket to the big dance. And that's and I think that's the reason why he's not in the Hall of Fame today, though he should be, according to my calculations, because I have him rate ra- top 30, according to my calculations. I mean, he was a great coach. I mean, just... But never the luck. That's the tragedy of Marty Schottenheimer. Never the luck. And it's, it's a sad thing. So I got a couple um, kind of follow-up questions then to you. So the first one would be like playoff value, for instance. I mean, we have two guys in the top five 
that for part of their careers, there weren't even any playoffs and then there were no championships for a while. Like, how did you go from genre to, or not genre, but um, from year to year type of thing, like different kind of, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, help me out here. Okay. For the, okay. Uh, for those, for the young, young uh, sports fans uh, from 1920 to 1932, there were no playoffs in the NFL. The, uh, po- the postseason did not exist. The postseason was invented in 1933. And I, I talk about this in the beginning of my book. That was a struggle. I mean, uh, and finally, what I did was, um, what I did was, I merged certain categories like, um, uh, like playoff and first place finish. I merged them together, and then uh, earning a, a championship finals appearance and winning the championship. I merged them together. So basically, it was like an equivalent. Even though there was no playoff, I would uh, it was converse. I would order them the same proportion of type points. So basically, I wasn't cheating them with. Uh, with regards to those coaches who competed in the play, postseason era of 1933 to the present time, that's how I was able to compensate and get a, a more truer value. I just simply merged the two together for those coaches. I only involved a few coaches. I believe it was George Hallis, Curly Lambeau, uh, Guy Chamberlain, and who was that fourth coach? Yeah, Jimmy Conzelman. They're the, the only four coaches who I had to do that tweaking for in that sense. Uh, but, uh, but the rest, you know, they're all, they all por- competed in the uh, postseason era. So I could just retain the system as you see in the book there, Arnie. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Cause most of them were in the postseason era. What about, you know, the various leagues that have come and gone where coaches have played in, or coached in both leagues? Like, how did you account for that? Okay. Uh, my book accounts, not just in the NFL, but also its predecessor league, the a- the American Professional Football Players Association, which existed from 1920 to 1921. That was the precursor to the NFL. The NFL didn't get its official name until 1922. I incorporated all, co- all eligible coaches from the AFL from 60 to 69, which is now the American AFC. Also, the AAFC, the All-American Football Conference, which competed against the NFL from 46 to 1949. That's where you get the Cleveland Browns and the San Francisco 49ers from, and for a time, the Baltimore Colts. Uh, But I do not count the World Football League, nor um, the USFL, I don't count them, nor the XFL. Uh, the first XFL or the one that exists now, that those are, those leagues are not counted whatsoever because uh, they were never incorporated into the official records, you know, by the NFL. Now, the NFL, they did absorb the records of the AAFC and the AFL, but not uh, the WFL or the USFL or the XFL. They have never they have never done that at all. And I did not acknowledge that either. What about like so so Bud Grant, for instance, coming over from CFL? Did you at all give him credit for that, or was that totally excluded? No, no, the uh, CFL absolutely, positively not. Uh, no, okay. But as far as I know, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, Bud Grant is the only CFL coach to coach in the Super Bowl and the Grey Cup. I I I, I, can't, I think so. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't. I can't think of any other NFL coach who did that. You know, both leagues, but yeah, uh, Bud Grant and all that. Yeah. Uh, but no, CFL is not factored in whatsoever. No, no. Okay. So, I mean, we named off a lot of coaches in there and there's this huge list at the end of your book, of course, beyond like your top 50. What would be maybe, I don't know, a surprise in the list or a couple of surprises where they fell after you ran your calculations? You're like, man, I got to rerun this one. Surprising. Um, hmm. I was surprised that Tony Dungy rated as high as he did. I had him within the top 15. I knew he was a great coach, but I didn't realize how really great he was. I mean, he, literally, Tony Dungy uh, was the great, is the greatest African-American NFL coach of all time, followed by Mike Tomlin at Pittsburgh there. I mean, I, I was just astounded. In fact, Tony Dungy, here's the sad part. He could have ranked in the top 10 if he hadn't had horrible postseason luck in his coaching career. I mean, for a time, he was a heartbreak coach. He had six playoff failures until finally, he finally made it to the Super Bowl. And thank God, you know, he finally won and all that. But he had horrible luck. He just couldn't earn a ticket to the Super Bowl. And I think if he had been able to get add a couple more Super Bowl appearances or and or titles to his record, I think he could he would have cracked the top 10, according to my calculation. So that was a bit of surprise there. Uh, another surprise. Uh, 
I think Parcells, I, the fact that I had him ranked not top 10 or not even top 15, I had him in the top 20. But then when I looked at his record, I, I came to some interesting conclusions. For all of his greatness as a coach, he he would have some individual great seasons, but he could never sustain at a high level like Belichick could, like George Hallis could, or Vince Lombardi, or Chuck Knoll. No, no. He could, uh, like in the B, his BQ and B5 values, not as good as those guys because he might have an individual great season, then there would be drop off. Like after he won his first Super Bowl in 86, guess what? The Giants didn't even make the playoffs, and I think they finished in last place that following season. Uh, I mean, like after he led the Patriots to the Super Bowl, then he had a drop off. I mean, there was that period of inconsistency. He had, he never, he never could really maintain. Like Dallas, he had one great season, and then he had he had drop off there. So that was his curse, and that's why he doesn't he he didn't rank higher than other people might expect, and all of that. Yeah, that was another surprise. Let's see another surprise. Huh. Hmm, another surprise. Those are, those are the ones that really come. That's the ones that really come to mind off the top of my head, Arnie. Yeah. Well, that, that's a good transition, though, because you said like other people expect. So have you had any, I want to say criticisms, but you know how sports debates go. Anybody reach out and say, hey, I think this guy should have been way higher or lower. I can't believe it. You're crazy for this one. You know, Arnie, I've had some prior interviews to our, to our session here. And the one question people have been asking me, because he's just been inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, why isn't Dick Vermeil in the top 50? And I've been having to explain it, and I will explain it right here and now. Uh, nothing against Dick Vermeil, because as a long-suffering Philadelphia Eagles fan, I was so glad that he was able to lead the team to the Super Bowl and uh, Super Bowl 15 and all that. And I'm, and I'm happy for him. I applaud his induction, and I don't question or begrudge it in any way, shape, or form. But when doing my calculations, he he was always taking on rebuilding projects with Philadelphia, with the Rams, and with the Kansas City Chiefs. And he had some very lean years that really damaged him in the career and the coaching value category, the average season rating category, uh, and his regular season category there. I mean, uh, like he had two bad losing seasons with the Eagles and then finally in 78 and 70, 79 and 80, he was able to turn it around. But then even after that Super Bowl appearance, the following season, he, there was a drop off there. His first two seasons with the Los Angeles Rams, both times they finished in last place. I mean, he lost a lot of points off his uh, career value. It damaged his average season rating. It damaged his uh, regular season value and playoff value enormously there. I mean, he lost like 26 points off his coaching value, which is a huge loss there. Uh, but then finally he turned it around. And he was able to win that Super Bowl. Then when he came back with the Kansas City Chiefs, again, he had like three losing seasons there and it damaged him. And, and uh, I think Dick Vermeule's biggest mistake is and he later had told this, I think, in a book called Coaching Confidential with Gary Myers. He said his biggest mistake was when he retired after he won that Super Bowl out and then after the 1933 season. Uh, he said that was his, I was it 34, yeah, Super Bowl 34, yeah. He said that was 24, no, 24, 30, no, 34. He said that was his biggest mistake. He said he should have stayed. And guess what? He's right. Because I did a what if scenario. Let's say, you know, his successor was Mike Martz, who actually had a great, uh, uh, span right after Vermeil left. If he had gotten the same results as Mike Martz, okay, and kept going with the Rams and got the exact same results, he would have made the top 50 ranks according to my calculations, but he didn't do it. So we can't go on what ifs. I have to go on what his coaching record really, really was. And that's why Dick Vermeule is ranked 58th according to my calculations. And again, I'm not begrudging his induction in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I, I loved him as a coach. He was a great coach, and I wish him all the best in the world. But if you put in mean, Dick Vermeil, I also think you should induct Marty Schottenheimer, who is ranked in among the top 30. Buddy Parker, who is ranked among the top 35. You should put, induct Blanton Collier, who is even ranked uh, in the, among the top 25, even better than Marty Schottenheimer. Uh, and also uh, Don Coriel, who's in the top 45. I mean, because they all had records that, according to my calculations, were superior to Vermeil's. 
even though of them all, only Bland Connor actually won, a, 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 only Parker and Connor actually won championships. But still, their overalls much were much better than Vermeil's in that sense. Uh, and that's 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 a, that's one question I keep getting bombarded with, you know, amongst uh, you know uh, uh, podcasters and radio hosts and all that. Yeah, I mean, speaking of interviews, um, being on the other side when you're interviewing these players or former coaches or anything like that, I mean, I know it was a plethora of individuals, but is this couple one or two stick out that give you a really cool story, maybe like that we ne- never heard before? I think when Doug Plank talked about Buddy Ryan and the 46 Stevens, I mean, Plank was very emotional about it. I mean, I, I saw that ESPN 30 for 30, which talked about the 85 Bears, and the focus was on uh, Buddy Ryan and the, and, and, and the Bears defense. That man really touched hearts. I mean, he was like a father figure to Plank, to Singletary, to Refrigerator Perry, uh, and McMichael, to McMichaels and Dent. I mean, and this the way the swagger they had when they were running that 46 defense, especially during the Super Bowl season, it was something to behold. I mean, the day that I mean, they talk about it today. He said they you couldn't run that 46 defense today because he said they would always be suspected and banned because they would just, today would be deemed dirty play, excessive and dirty. They would all be suspended, you know, blows to the head and all that. But back then, you could do that stuff. And and Plank really captured the swagger of it, and so did Jim McMahon too. They captured the the awesome swagger of it, and you could tell Plank got emotional about it. I mean, the words were just pouring out of him. I mean, we talked. I've got I think it was like seventy to eighty minutes of tape with Doug Plank. That was that was something to behold there. I mean, it was just incredible. Um, Gary Beebe talking about the Buffalo Bills under Marv Levy. I mean, his love for Marv Levy was so powerful. And we talked about, you know, the, those four consecutive losses. And we get into if they had been able to win Super Bowl 25, what could have had altered the psychic, the psychological balance for the subsequent three? And he thought it would have, you know, if they had gotten that first one under their belts, that would have made an emotional difference in all of that. And we talked about Mike Holmgren. I mean, Gary Beebe was fantastic with me. Just gave me beautiful chapter and verse about what made both men tick, but he loved Marv Levy. And you got a real good sense of what it was that made Marv Levy the great coach that he was. And I actually talked to Marv Levy myself and he, his humor and his intellect were just absolutely sensational. We got in, he was so innovative with his special teams. I mean, he was one of the first coaches to give the special teams units a real esprit de corps. In other words, you're not just cast offs and bench players here. You're an elite unit and you can make a difference in games. And George Allen gave him his head. And that's why, like, uh, George Allen's special teams when he was with the Rams and the Redskins, they were absolutely sensational. And they, they were able to steal many a victory for those two teams when George Allen was a coach and Marv Levy was there, you know, uh, helping, helping making that happen. And Levy really gave me some good insight about – you know, his innovations in terms of special teams and all that. Uh, that was a real a good moment in time. Um, Tom Flores was beautiful with me. I interviewed him like a couple months just before he got word that he was inducted in the Hall of Fame. And he was absolutely sensational with me. Gave me great insights about his concept as a coach and all that. You know, coaching the team, winning those two Super Bowls against the Eagles and in the Redskins. He was absolutely fantastic with me. Yeah. Also talking about, you know, serving as an assistant coach under John Mann, great insider views, you know, about what made Mann a great coach and all that. Do you have all of that? So you, when you interviewed, you actually record and you have footage of it still or, or audio? Uh, strictly audio. Uh, every uh, L- uh, interview was done over the telephone. and I, uh, It's all strictly MP3 tapes. Not, there was never by Zoom or in person or anything like that. I, I just didn't have the time or the money. Everything was done over the telephone. Actually, it's much, much simpler the, uh, these days to do that. You know? And I think it's it's less a strain on the person being interviewed and all of that. Just You just sit in front of your phone and just answer questions. Questions for like thirty to forty minutes. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. And uh, so you talk about a lot of these coaches from the past. Uh, what about this season? Do you have any inkling? Is there a coach maybe in the current season that might be able to crack the top fifty at the end of the year? Keep your eyes on Buffalo with Sean McDermott. I mean, right now he's ranked sixtieth. If he had been able to win the Super Bowl last season with Buffalo, get them in and win, he could have come. I, if he wouldn't have broken into the top 50, he would have come so close. I think 
If, if he breaks through, if he can actually take Buffalo and win the Super Bowl this season, I think it will be enough to break through the barrier and get him into the top 50, according to my calculations. The only thing holding him back is his lack of playoff luck. I think he's like one more playoff defeat away from be entering the heartbreak coaching ranks. Again, you need five playoff defeats without ever getting into the Super Bowl. You don't have to win the Super Bowl. Just get, get into the Super Bowl to stop being a heartbreak coach. He's got four playoff losses. And if he fails to reach the Super Bowl again this season, he will enter the heartbreak coaching ranks. But if he breaks through, gets them in, and he wins the Super Bowl, don't be surprised if he actually break, cracks the top 50, according to my calculations. He's he's so close, so close. So if, speaking of so close and the crack in the top 50, so is this a print-on-demand book? So if you were to update it, would it then be the updated, or is it pre-printed? I don't think I'm going to do updates and all that because I didn't do that with my subsequent two, uh, uh, the others I self-published, Art of the Dealers, the NHL Greatest General Managers, and my college football book, Lords of the Gridiron. I didn't do that, no. But what I do is online, I'll update my charts and just simply post the charts online at Facebook there to get get a sense of it. I mean, if you link up with me you know, on some of my web pages there, like uh, the College Football History and Literature Appreciation page on Facebook, you'll see I, I do I, for the last couple of years, I have posted my updated college football coaching charts to reflect the changes and all of that. It's like Jimbo Fisher. When my book, college football book came out, he was not in the top 50. But guess what? At, based on the last two seasons, he did crack the top 50. Yeah, he did. So, so you see, there's a change there, and I think after the, the, this ne- our next Super Bowl here, I'll be posting some stuff online, updating you know where the coaches are. I mean, because it's kind of like the stock market. Uh, if your stock isn't going up, it may be going down or it could be stagnating. Like Bill Belichick, you know, if my book had come out a year ago or two years ago, Bill Belichick would have been ranked number one. But he's not ranked number one now because of his last two seasons. He had that losing season due to COVID nineteen, and then last season, he didn't he didn't get his he didn't win the divisional title, and he didn't go far in the playoffs, and that kind of damaged him a little bit. And uh, right now, New England's having a bit of a problem. Uh, hopefully, he can get out of it because if he wants to get that number one spot, he has to have another really great super season. He's really got to go have a real great regular season, then go far in the playoffs. And if he doesn't do that, then he's not going to be able to regain that top spot, according to my calculations. Yeah. How much time does it take to say, now that you have everything said and done, to recalculate everything? Oh, as soon as the Super Bowl is over, I just uh, pick out those active coaches who are eligible. Like I said, you have to have a minimum of five seasons under your belt to be eligible. And then I just I just key, uh, just uh, crunch the numbers it takes me like about, about a week or so to, you know, to do an update and all that. So I figure, let's see, the Super Bowl is like mid-February. So I figure by the end of February, that's when you'll see uh, the new numbers come out and all of that. Uh, that's when you, yeah, that's when you'll see the new evaluation and all that. Yeah, you know, like for my college football boy, after the national championship game is playing in January, but then my pot, my pool of college football coaches is much uh, larger, so it's going to take a lot more time. I think like takes like three weeks or so, you know, to to, to do the num- crunch the numbers and then print out the, do the calculations and all of that. So it's kind of like end of January, early February when you actually get the final rankings and all that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's a perfect timing because that lull in between the Super Bowl before the draft happens, so it gives, or before free agency, it gives someone something to look forward to. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. speaking of something to look forward to, I so I, we got it, you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, but let's give some love to maybe two or three of your favorite childhood sports historians or authors. Like, who who did you follow growing up? Um. Peter Golenbach, who's also a Facebook friend of mine, I've had him on my own personal podcast, The Package Tourist, a couple of times in, in recent years. Uh, his book, Dynasty, uh, and I've got a, a good bit of his books, mostly his baseball books, and also his oral history of the Dallas Cowboys, which I use the source material for uh, my present book here, Lords of Gridiron 2, and also his oral history of the Florida Gators, which I use for my third book, Lords of the Grand College Football's Greatest Coaches. Uh, I, I got a, a good many of his books, mostly his baseball oral histories. And that really enhanced my love of sports history. And 
And I wanted, and I, growing up, I wanted to be able to write books just like Peter Golenbach did, though my books are not on the same level as his. I mean, I would love one day to have like the same level of fame, you know, and recognition that he has achieved. But I mean, he was like, he was like a standard uh, for which to aspire to. And hopefully one day I might, I might be able to reach his level. But it, all the times I interviewed him, he was absolutely fantastic with me, very kind and sweet. And, um, and I, and it was a great honor and thrill. And he has always been an inspiration to me. Uh, the late Dave Halberstam, one, don't laugh when he wasn't writing political books, he actually wrote sports books uh, that are, are very, very good. And I enjoyed them very, very much. And I enjoyed his sports books. Um, who else? Terry Pluto, who used to, uh, has done a lot of writing for like the about the Cleveland Browns, the Cleveland Indians, now the Guardians, you know, blah blah blah, and all that. You know, I mean, he he's always been a, a favorite sports author of mine. Um, but they they they, they, come, they they're the ones who come to mind and all of that. But you know, but history as a whole, Will and Ariel Durant, their eleven volumes of the history of civilization. Those were early inspirations for me. Bruce Cadness Civil War book, Shelby Foote his Civil War trilogy. Uh, I like good political history, good military history. Stephen Ambrose, the, the the late Stephen Ambrose, his his biographies, his works on Crazy Horse and Custer, his. Uh, his two volumes on Eisenhower, his three volumes on Nixon. Again, inspirational works for me and all that. It, it fed my love of history. Those are prime examples of my literary influences. Okay, well, speaking of your childhood memories, uh, well, let's do this then. I don't know if you can see this. This is a, you get to ride the DeLorean. <laughs> so you're going to head back in time with me and you get to take that DeLorean back to any point in NFL history and you get to basically it's kind of like hard knocks. You get to be part of their season. Uh, any coach, any season, where are you going? Well, Lombardi, 67 Packers, man. I mean, reading Jerry Kramer's book, getting into that feeling of with Lombardi and all that, the, the, the epic, I mean, it was a hard slog. I mean, they only won nine, they only went nine, four and one in 67. Uh, and in fact, they went into the playoffs with a two game losing streak. I mean, People were not expecting them to take it. They thought the Rams were going to take it, and they had to take on the Rams in that very first round, but they beat the Rams. I mean, it show, it just goes to show you it, it didn't matter what the regular season was. Now we're in the playoffs. Now this is when we really come alive and really start showing what we can really do, and they did it. And then the ice bowl. I mean, what an epic battle that was. I mean, what uh, it was not just a game. It was an ordeal. I mean – they weren't the, the Packers and the Cowboys weren't battling each other. They were also it was a three way dance. They were also battling Mother Nature too, and it, it, what how they endured and persevered and then finally triumphed is something for the history books to win three consecutive NFL titles. You know, which has never been equaled. I mean, today you had to equal this thing. You have to win three consecutive Super Bowls, and that's never been done. And to surpass it, you have to win four consecutive Super Bowls. It, it, it just, I, I often wonder, will it ever be accomplished? And I have my doubts, especially with free agency as it is, and just the inability to three-peat. It's just, I, I don't know if it can ever be surpassed. Yeah, they've won, coaches have matched him winning two consecutive Super Bowls to surpass him now. No, but I think that's the measure of Vince Lombardi, as it were. Another season, ride the thing. Hmm. Hmm. Trying to think. Another one. I think the Kansas City Chiefs in 69, what they had to go through that last season. I mean, Len Dawson losing six weeks because he had to rehab that league because he tore those ligaments and all that. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, also, he, not only that, he lost his father that season. He had to cope with that. And then on the eve of Super Bowl IV, the, 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 those weird allegations, he was quote-unquote involved with gamblers, which turned out to be nothing, but he had to endure the stress of that. He came through with that. I mean, the Chiefs overcoming the skepticism. I mean, they went into Super Bowl IV. They were like, Oh, the Vikings are going to beat them. Was it by like 13 or 14 points? Oh, totally underestimated. And yet they picked the Vikings apart. I mean, with their 4 3 stack defense, with their short, they're able to figure out the purple people leaders by using short yardage. I mean, just a good ground game. They actually used three times. They used wide receiver reverses that always that gained first downs all three times. Trickery right there. 
And, and they just, they, they picked them apart. They just beat the Minnesota Vikings. I mean, I know Gary Larson, when I asked him, I asked him for his analysis. What was it? What went wrong? And he said, the Chiefs had the size. Oh, their offensive line was so big. He said, they, they, they were bigger than we were. You know, uh, and he said their defensive line was so massive. I mean, Buck Buchanan, 6'9", 290. I mean, he and Ernie Ladd were the prototypes of the modern-day monster defensive linemen, and as it were. And they were so quick and so able to fill those gaps. I mean, Willie Lanier was so sensational there. And the fact that they, they used Buck Buchanan and Curly Culp as nose tackles to seal off Mick Tinglehoff to prevent him from taking out Willie Lanier because they noticed the Vikings ground game right up the you know, going through the one hole because Mick Tinglehoff, who's, who was a future Hall of Famer, he could take out the middle linebacker. And that's why the running backs used to go straight up the middle there by putting Buchanan or Coley Cope on Mick Tinglehoff's head. That shielded Will and Lanier, and Lanier was able to fill the gaps and make the necessary tackles and seal up seal up anything. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. Great. Yeah, a couple of great seasons to go to, and I mean, there's so much more that are in the books. So and yeah. let's just do that. Let's let's remind the listener of the show what this book is and where they can find all of your books. Okay, again, the title is "Lords of the Great Iron Two: Pro Football's Greatest Coaches" and is up on Amazon and only at Amazon. You have to purchase it online. It's on sale at thirty percent off, and it will remain on sale until after. Super the Super Bowl was played. Super Bowl Fifty Seven is played, which is you know till mid February. So get it while you can. It's a stocking. If you want to buy a stocking stuffer for if your husband or brother or son, you know, or grandson is into the NFL, it's a great stocking stuffer. Uh, ages you know from middle school age on upward, it's vastly entertaining. It'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. And you'll learn a great you'll learn a great deal about the greatest football coaches in NFL history. And what about any last words of gridiron knowledge nuggets for the listener of the show? <sighs> trying, trying to think. I, I mean, I through the lens of through the lens of the greatest coaches. I think. I mean, the great ones. If there's a commonality, they trusted in their assistants. They knew how to delegate. They let their assistants coach. Very few of them were real micromanagers, um, with the exception of maybe Tom Landry. But most of the others. They gave them the space. They let their they let their assistants grow. Marty Schottenhammer let, uh, developed Bill Cowher into a great coach. Uh, Mike McCarthy grew, uh, got, uh, grew under Marty Schottenheimer's tutelage. They knew how to do Bill Walsh. Oh man, his coaching tree alone was just enormous. His ability not not just to inspire his assistant coaches, but to give them the room. And he did everything he could to help them get promoted. George Seifert, Mike Holmgren, Dennis Green. And then those coaches inspired others. You know, Mike Andy Reid grew under Mike Holmgren, and then Andy Reid is inspiring his generations. I mean, being that inspirational presence and to help your your subordinates and your players grow, I think that is the key to coaching greatness. There you go. Let the debate begin. I mean, we didn't get into the entire list, of course, but that is something that I'm sure you can do if you head over and grab your copy of the book. First thing you do. Head over to Amazon, go ahead and pick up Lords of the Great Iron 2, Pro Football's Greatest Coaches. And while you're at it, don't forget to check out SportsHistoryNetwork.com for all the sports history that you can handle. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to the FootballHistoryDude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. Hi, everybody. Dan and Andrew from Hello Old Sports here. We wanted to drop in and let you know about our latest episode. That's right. We interviewed the co-authors of Phyllis George, Shattering the Ceiling, a biography of groundbreaking broadcaster Phyllis George. And her life is really sort of a journey through 20th century America, from Miss America pageants to the Kentucky State House to the groundbreaking NFL Today show on CBS, even the Kentucky Colonels, the old ABA. We got into all sorts of stories about the Celtics under Red Auerbach, about the interview with Roger Staubach, about really all sorts of things, a fight between Brent Musburger and Jimmy the Greek. We really enjoyed talking with Lenny Shulman and Paul Volponi, who teamed up to write this book. 
The book is on sale right now wherever books are sold. But, but, you know, within reason, garage sales, probably not. So go <laughs> ahead and pick up a copy today. And if you want a chance to win the book, you can go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash giveaways and register for a chance to win. Goodbye, old sports.